Hey, race fans, Hall of Famer Daryl Walter here. You know it's time to drop the green flag on another edition of Leaning Right and Turning Left with Sadler and the Senator, powered by Pacematic. So, hey, pull those bells tight one more time. Here's my buddy Hermie Sadler and Senator Bill Stanley. Boogity, boogity, boogity. Let's see what they have to say, boys and girls. Hello, everybody. I'm Virginia State Senator Bill Stanley, and I'm Leaning Right. And I'm former NASCAR driver and Fox Sports TV analyst, Hermie Sadler, and I'm turning left. And you're listening to Leaning Right and Turning Left with Sadler and the Senator. We're here today high atop the Stanley Law Group skyscraper in the Stanley Law Group offices and conference room in the Stanley Law Group studio. What a great day we're going to have. Well, our show is powered by Pacematic. Got to get a sponsor mention in. That's your job. And... I'm guessing by all the Stanley Law Group mentions in the naming of the studio that the we don't have a, a paying sponsor yet to name the studio after. We are in deep negotiations with a number of people who uh, want those naming rights, are willing to pay top dollar for those naming rights. But if anybody else wants to be a part of that competition, uh, they can reach us at the Stanley Law Group, 540-721-6028. We handle traffic matters, matters <laughs> criminal matters, civil matters, and naming rights for our uh, conference room. Boy, that's a lot. Thank you. It's, it's early, too. So on the podcast, we cover lots of different topics. We've talked about law. We've talked about politics. We've talked about your wonderful life in the General Assembly (laughs) these days as a state senator. We've talked about racing, NASCAR racing, and today we get a little bit of both and something new. Today, at the top of the show, we're going to talk to none other than Todd Parnell, known as nope, nobody even knows your really what your first name is. I'm trying to figure out why I'm here because you guys are just talking right over me like I'm a tennis net. <laughs> it's going to be that way the whole time. God, he must be best friends with Elliot Sadler. <laughs> Elliot, unless Elliot was talking two seconds into this thing, he thought he was being ignored. So there you go. I'm trying to set the table on. Enough what? about me. Can I tell you more about myself? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> you got First, you got 20 minutes. <laughs> What is your official title with the Flying Squirrels? By uh, the way? Today it's a CEO. After this show, it's probably going to be former CEO former of the CEO. Flying Squirrels. <laughs> <laughs> the soon-to-be former CEO of the yeah. Richmond Flying Squirrels, Parney. Uh, Nobody first, knows my name, by the way. I know that. Yeah. They know you by Parney, though, right? Or they know you by your pants. Uh, the pants and Parney, uh, one name and a bunch of pants. So here's what they can expect today. We're going to speak to Parney about the upcoming season of the Richmond Flying Squirrels at the top of the show. And then the second half of the show, Bill, Lynn O'Neill, who is a former uh, competitor of mine, I raced against him on the late model stock car ranks. He is doing his best to try and save the historic Southside Speedway right here in Richmond, Virginia. And we're going to have Lynn O'Neill on so he can tell us about why and how he is trying to save that speedway. Well, and and it's a great speedway with a lot of history. I mean, since the very formation of NASCAR and and we'll find out that we have a, a, a champion, an American hero, the Jackie Robinson of NASCAR, who won a track championship there. So I'm excited wow. about talking with him as much, almost as much as with Parney and Parney's pants. There you go. Thank you. First question, when can Senator Stanley and I bring a bunch of people out to the ballpark and act stupid and run around like we own the place? <laughs> well, Hermie, that's all the time for you, buddy, <laughs> which is perfectly fine. Uh, April 12th is our first game for this year. Hard to believe it'll be our 13th season. Here in Richmond, I always count 2020 because even though we didn't play any games, that season should count because it took about 15 years off my life. I remember, I think you called me or texted me or vice versa on the day you got the news of your 2020 season mm-hmm. not happening. Can you? I know you probably don't want to think back. Hermie, I'm still going to therapy for this. Why are you bringing it up already? (laughs) This is therapy. (laughs) Oh, oh, really? It's free. (laughs) I promise you. I am a doctor of law, but (laughs) when you leave here today, you're going to be a new man. Uh, I I know. I am every time I'm around you, Hermie. But one thing, one thing I love about you is your passion for the squirrels, and more importantly than that, for the area that supports you, and you support the area of Richmond. So what? What kind of blow was that to you and the team and to baseball and to the community? Well, you know, we got here in 2009 under the cover of darkness. Nobody even knew who we were. It's funny now, you know, with the pants and the one name and all that, like I really can't walk down. I mean, I I was in the parking lot and a Duke fan, because you and I are Carolina fans, a Duke fan started talking to me because she recognized 
the pants. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, it's it's hard to believe that's been that long ago. But 2020, when everything stopped, I I make it was June 30th, and we knew we weren't going to play. And, and I make the analogy of. Unfortunately, we've all had relatives or, or uh, family pets that have had long illnesses, and you know what's going to happen, right? They're not going to survive. Uh, but then when that moment happens, it's still a shock. And I remember when I got the phone call and just sitting at my desk on June 30th, 2020, and just crying like a baby. But then, much to the credit of our staff and our fan base, we just got back to work. We still had fireworks on July 4th in Richmond, Virginia, with no fans in the stands, and we broadcasted on CBS 6. So very proud of how we overcame 2020, just like y'all did. And NASCAR probably did the best job of anybody, to be honest with you. First ones to come back. Yeah, really, just, yeah. but probably did a better job than anybody. But uh, now we're, we're getting our swagger back. 2021 was um, just trying to make some of that money back and, and uh, kind of get our feet back on the table. And 2020, 2022 now is more, you know, we're looking at April 12th, but we're looking at the whole season. We have 69 games at home, 69 games on the road. It's really, really, really starting to feel a lot like 2019 and before. What can people, Elliot and I have had an opportunity to go to a lot of games. What a great family experience. Y'all do a really good job, better than most at that level, better than anybody at that level that I've ever been to. Keep going. You're getting warm. Keep going. (laughs) far as creating that fan experience but what uh what 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 do you guys try to do to enhance that fan experience well it's about everybody right and whether you're two or 102 uh we want you to make memories we're not in the baseball business we're not in the entertainment business we're in the memory making business so that means we got to have a whole bunch of stuff right like you might not like baseball but you might like foot long hot dogs you might not like baseball, but you might want to get an autograph from a guy. I like who's watching good. you stand in right field with that fishing net trying to catch a ball. And there's a lot of people that like that because I make a fool out of myself on a nightly basis, which is okay. I spent 33 years of my early baseball. Self-deprecating humor is, is my gig, right? But it's fine. So you got to have something for everybody, and that's what they're going to get in 2022. But there's so much else going on. Um, you know, Major League Baseball took over the minor leagues during the pandemic, so we had the tsunami mm-hmm. – the tsunami of the pandemic and the tsunami of the commissioner's office making a hundred year change. Yeah. I mean, a realignment, especially for our lower uh, level leagues in the rural areas, uh, we took big hits. So Virginia lost some teams. Um, and, and, uh, as Danville. far as affiliation, Danville, Martinsville, which I know Herman, you have a soft spot in your heart for Martinsville. Uh, it was painful. I've had in my 33 year career, I've had friends who in 2020 lost their entire franchise, lost their jobs, had been saving money for years and years to quote unquote sell the team in their retirement years, and they lost it. So it was very traumatic experiences, right? Um, but our job is to make sure that everybody leaves with a smile on their face, whether we win 12 to 2 or lose 12 to 2. And Hermie, we don't control the players on the field. It, it's almost like when you were driving, if you just showed up and somebody else was in charge of everything but you driving, mm-hmm. right? And you got in the car, and maybe they gave you a car that didn't handle well. And you finished in the back. That's that's you had no control over that. That's that's the same with us. We don't know what players are going to show up on April the twelfth, but we know that we have to provide them a fan-oriented, memory-making experience at the diamond. And another thing, because I know you, you're working hard for Virginia Senator, three hundred sixty-five days a year. We try to be here for our community, three hundred sixty-five days a year. Our corporate philosophy, when somebody asks us to do something, is to start it yes and go backwards from there. That sounded really good, didn't that it? I tell you what, that is <laughs> I like it. That is more eloquent than yeah. I, I didn't know. I didn't know I'd like to announce my candidacy for something <laughs> right. at this point. I'm I'm giving you a donation tomorrow. <laughs> this is great. So I want to ask you about how the community in the Richmond, Virginia area has supported you. But tell our listeners and our viewers on YouTube about your history in baseball. We, how did you end up in Richmond? I know it's been a, a, a long and yeah. it's always been glamorous and prosperous, I know. <laughs> like the racing business, right? Like the racing right? business. Never a bad day. But te- what, what has your life in baseball been like well, to get you here today? I was born in a town called Locust, North Carolina, which I mentioned that because it has pertinence to the Saddlers. Uh, I grew up listening to Concord Motorsports Park on Saturday nights mm-hmm. from my front yard. 
Dell Sr., Richard Childress, um, Dave Marcus. They were all driving at that time. I will say the home for Sadler Stanley Racing Open Wheel Modified Team is in Midland, North Carolina. Yeah, which is the, the ice cream shops in Midland. That's yeah. where I used to go when I got... That you, one, that one A on my, cream? Oh, I got that one A on my report card. You my you mom and dad took me to. You can't tell it by looking at you. Yeah, hey, I ain't missed a meal. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, but I grew up down there, loving sports. Uh, and at some point, there's only a very small percentage of people who get to play as long as they want to. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to be ready for that. Uh, and so I made a lot of relationships. And long story short, in 1989. I started this career with the Reading Phillies in Reading, Pennsylvania, and uh, it's been a love affair ever since. Richmond is my favorite place because we built something from nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, Senator, you probably remember when the Richmond Braves left yes. to go to Gwinnett because of <laughs> because of the ballpark issue, and I'm, I'm smiling because the bar- ballpark issue still exists. So, uh, but we uh, wait a minute. What is the ballpark issue? Well, we need a new ballpark. <laughs> It's yeah. an old ballpark. Yeah, but I'm telling you, th- remember the R Braves had some of had all of those all stars from Atlanta the grade eight. through Richmond. The Great Eight. The Great Eight, and uh, and I was growing up. You know, I was going to college back then, and it was great to come yeah. up here and watch a game with those guys. Yeah, and and so that's the kind of thing. Like everybody's got memories. So uh, why can't we get a new ballpark? <laughs> well, I don't know. We can probably walk down the street and talk to some politicians. Uh, uh, but we're, we're good thing I'm not on camera. I, mean, <laughs> I know nothing. I know nothing. Sergeant Schultz. Uh, but but we we've been working towards it, and it's going to happen, Hermie. And here's why: I mentioned Major League Baseball overtook the minor leagues. The reason they did that was because of facilities around the country not being up to their uh, standards. Mm-hmm. Kind of like, I'm sure, well, North Wilkesboro is, yep. is a good example, yep. right? That, that's exactly the same scenario. But Dale Jr. has spearheaded an effort to bring that back. Then we're going to call Dale Jr. on his cell phone right after this and spearhead this. Got him get... right in here. <laughs> um, but Major League Baseball, in, in cutting it, as the senator mentioned, they cut 40 teams out of the minor leagues. Mm-hmm. We were not on that list, even though the Diamond was built in 1984. Basically, that's a long, long story short is we're driving a car that was built in 1984 in 2022, and Major League Baseball wants us to drive a car that was built in 2022 or somewhere in that vicinity. Uh, we have got a great relationship with VCU, our great friend Ed McLaughlin. He's great, isn't he? Uh, one of my best friends. Yep. And we're we're combining our efforts. Uh, the mayor, Mayor Stoney, and some others, uh, economic development in Richmond, we should be able to get this ballpark done. Major League Baseball wants it done by 2025. Mm-hmm. But honestly, like cutting through all the jargon, it's life or death. Like Major League Baseball will either see a new ballpark here or they'll move us. They've been great to deal with. They've been great to deal with, and they want this to succeed here in Richmond, Virginia. And I wake up every single morning knowing that it's going to. It's been too good. Like we've drawn 5 million fans in, uh, in 11 seasons because of the one year we didn't have. Uh, in the ballpark that was built in 1984 because we do all the things, Hermie, that you've been talking about as far as making memories for fans and making sure that people, no matter uh, what age you are, have something to talk about when you leave the ballpark. So I even answer your question? Oh, yeah, he did great. <laughs> well, I think you asked how he started in baseball, and now we're talking about a new ballpark. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, well, you know, but that, on... that's, how he, that's how he works. I mean, Do you think that... it would help the calls at all if this – CEO of the team was a little bit better looking. <laughs> I don't know how that's possible, Hermanator. I don't. I don't know how that's possible. I'm pretty good looking anyway. Right? Good looks and personality have brought you a long way. <laughs> well, we try and, and good and good and he's, friends. And good he's friends. looking for a compliment when he says that. Oh, to you. Herman, you look awesome, yeah. by the way. About time and, you brought that and up. And <laughs> congrats to the Tar Heels on another great season. And I'm looking forward to great success in the Atlantic Coast Conference tournament. It's not been a wow, – where I, where I grew up – Not where been I, the best of seasons for the Tar Heels. So we're working it a little bit well, on the compliment. Okay, well, just let me know. Where I grew up, when you were born, the doctors didn't slap you on the fanny. They raised you up and they said, state or Carolina? Yeah. And your parents at that time had to declare who you were. And my parents said, Carolina. Yeah. Because, as we all know, North Carolina State is inferior. Now, Chapel we, Hill. We can agree with that other than I have to admit that being in the petroleum business and having a lot of uh, customers that are in the farming and agriculture business, I have a lot of customers that are Virginia Tech and NC State affiliates. 
So I will not be talking about NC State or Virginia <laughs> Tech on this show <laughs> negatively because it will negatively impact my business. So our shortstop last year, Will Wilson, is a graduate of North Carolina State. Is that right? And I was, every time he walked by, because I got my picture of Phil Ford on my wall. Mm -hmm. and one of my favorite people. One of my favorite players of all time. Mm -hmm. And someday I want to I want to meet him again and hang out with with you. But Will, we we had we had barbs, so that's one of the reason sports is so awesome, right? Because you have rivalries. Like you you might like somebody, you might like somebody, and you have an instantaneous thing to give each other junk on. That's right. And that's why you know NASCAR. You might be a Dell Dell Earnhardt senior fan. You might be a Jeff Gordon fan back in the day. Mm -hmm. Instant stuff. That's why I love sports so much, and I think that's why sports is the great. Connector. I believe I believe that too. So you're sitting between me and a politician, right? The, the political climate, a human being, and a space alien is what he just said. <laughs> Go back hey. and type it on your computer. I'm asking him a serious question. Um, you've had. I'm waiting for the, the serious the, question. Here we the go. The political <laughs> climate, not only in Virginia but across the country, has been, we like to say the term chippy lately. But you, in your position, you need Republicans and Democrats, people all across the board, to unite in your cause for a new ballpark and to support the team. So how do you navigate being what you need to be to everybody all day, every day? Because the people on both sides of the aisle right. uh, can help you. Well, I mean, I, I think it's it's about just trying to – to help others or put others before self and just be... But I know you've never done that. Yeah, actually I have, believe it or not. Uh, you wouldn't think that I would, but but I do. And uh, it's it's a hard task, Hermie, honestly. I mean, you know, you, you, you're out in public. You know what that's like. And, you know, you, you try to say yes to people. I mean, I'll give you a good example. <laughs> the reason, One of the reasons you're sitting here right now, I remember you texting me and saying, I just saw you on a commercial. Remember yeah, that? Pawnee was advocating for the casinos. Yeah. Oh, and, was he? And, 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 <laughs> well, now you guys got something to give each other junk about. <laughs> it's hard to say junk, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In the Trump. Yeah. 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 Uh, it means and, a lot of different and, things. And, 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 that was, and that was just one of those situations where, where they asked me to do something, and I did think that it was good. But I'm also good. I mean, I also support small business posts. Guess what the flying squirrels are, Hermie? Small business. We're a small business. Right. And I feel like... And by the way, I wasn't giving you grief. I, I was joking with you right. about... Because I can understand totally how a facility like a potential casino plaza, having a relationship with them and co-promoting things with a, a business like that could potentially be good. And look, by the way, we're not really anti-casino. Right. I'm not. Right. I'm just not for the casinos well, coming in and right, right. taking away part of my business right. and give it to them. I think we can all coexist and, and stay in our lane and do good business. And I guess that's how I'm answering your question. Yeah. I think it's about trying to do good business every day, being a good person every day, doing right by others every day. And and I think if, if everybody tried to do that, it wouldn't be so chippy. Mm -hmm. But I think when it gets chippy is when people put their own self-interest first. Yeah. Uh, and and I think that's when it gets a little sideways. To, to In fact, the, I think the last time, and I'm gonna give you a chance to tell Senator Stanley how I he's performed, still typing on his how, on his how I performed last time I took BP over at the park. But I think the last time I actually came to a game, uh, Governor Governor McAuliffe was there. Mm -hmm. And I had a couple of beers with him in your in your office in there. <laughs> well, Terry didn't leave my office very often yeah. to, to go watch the game. He, <laughs> he missed a lot of the games up there. No, you and four million people had <laughs> drinks with with Terry McCullough. <laughs> well, that's something to be uh, you know, uh, on hey, the list for. I, I think he said the same thing about me. To be honest with you. <laughs> so tell tell Senator Stanley because I need that validation. With well, him. the main reason we need a new ballpark is when the Herminator took batting practice. He knocked a wall down in the outfit. I went yard. I mean, it was it was just uh, one after another. So much so that when we had the All Star Game in 2019, I invited both of the Sadler brothers to participate in the All Star Home Run Derby, the Celebrity Home Run Derby. But Hermie had assaulted the outfield wall so badly the last time he didn't think we could afford it. So he he negated to come <laughs> I up. I had those boys in the outfield. I mean, running away from me all day long. Two <laughs> words: corked bat. Yeah, and then uh, <laughs> or two words: steroids. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Was he growling every time he hit the ball? Yeah, then he was doing like the Incredible Hulk yeah, thing, like, the the Hulkamania. I can tell you what. 
hitting the baseball with a wooden bat is not my forte. No, you did you did fine, but it, but it, like every sport. No, I did better than fine. Come on now, <laughs> better than fine. Yeah. You look fine. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the I thing, look better get, than fine too. Get, getting back to sports for a second, like the one thing that's really cool about doing what I've done for all these years is seeing how hard it is to excel at other sports, right? Like like some of our best players would get in the cockpit of your car and not know which way to turn the car, mm -hmm. you know? Or we've had Mo Alley Cox, he plays tight end in the NFL right now, was a great college basketball player. He stood in with your brother at the Home Run Derby, he didn't know how to hold the bat. Mm -hmm. I mean, he knew how to hold the bat, but, right. you know, so it's really, really an interesting part to have a front row seat to see people excelling at sports at the highest level. I was curious, a comment you made, and Senator Stanley made it also, about the limited control you have of your roster mm -hmm. on a baseball team. You never know who's coming or going, who's leaving. And Well, back in the old days, I used to say, I don't know who's going to be on our roster till the bus door opens up when it arrives. Now we have this thing called the Internet that the senator's on right now. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, we've, he's play, we, we, he's we playing know. Sudoku <laughs> while we're doing this interview. Word with friends. Yeah. Word with friends. <laughs> um, so – our relationship with the San Francisco Giants, even though they're three thousand miles away, is is good, and and you know they're they're committed to the Richmond region. Uh, you know they had a chance when the commissioner uh, in Major League Baseball kind of redid everything. They could have asked to move somewhere else and have the commissioner put another team in here, but they wanted to be here because, Herman, you know me, we're great friends. Relationships is the name of the game. Sure, it's all about relationships. It's all about trying to treat people as good as you possibly can. And we're inhibited a little bit by the diamond physically, but that still doesn't mean we can't go above and beyond the call of duty when it comes to treating other people great. And that's what we do with the Giants players. We've sent 77 players to the big leagues since the Squirrels came into existence in 2010. At, every time we've been, of course, I'm not saying everybody – gets the treatment that we get. No, you, we you have the Sadler Sparkins parking spot Sadler right next Parker's to my spot. right next to Parney's pub. Right up pull right up to the you front. You need to come door. to Parney's pub. Yeah, sometime. I'm, I'm, thanks for the invite. I was waiting all there Hey, do go. I have to wear pants like you're wearing? Yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, I'm a little busy, but I'll try to fit something in. So I'm assuming Just wear pants, all right? Oh, that's that's a given. <laughs> sure. Long ones preferably. <laughs> uh, even if it's in the summertime. I'm guessing by the the uh, the nature of your pants it, you're somehow feeding off your relationship and friendship with John Daly. Mm -hmm. And I know Elliot joined you back a couple months <laughs> yeah, ago. He survived. He's, for the Pro-Am. He survived that. I, he's still getting over it. <laughs> and John Daly, he said he said y'all had a, a blast out there playing golf. So and what an interesting character John Daly appears to be. But you're close to him. So what, what, what do we not know about John Daly that we should? He's one of the most loyal, sincere people I've ever met. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about when we were texting back and forth the day that the season canceled. Mm -hmm. The actual first person that texted me that day was John Daly. Mm -hmm. he, had, he had seen it somewhere on a ticker or something like that. And he's like, hey, bro, you okay? Is everything all right? And so that's the thing. Like sometimes people lose that on me too. I'm big and gregarious and I wear the crazy pants. Uh, but being a good, loyal friend is is the, the center of the of the field for me and it's the same for JD. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the things that's that's cool about what we do, you know, the the the, the friendship base you you introduced me to Jeff Jarrett yep. who's been on this show. Double J, J. And J, JJ and I become amazingly great friends and now he's involved in the baseball business, mm -hmm. you know. So it's really slap fun. nuts, peanuts, slap nuts, mm -hmm. and it's. Uh, it's Are you going to sell those at the squirrels? You know, squirrels he, love slap nuts. Trust, nuts. trust me, Double J called me about it because that, <laughs> that guy would sell anything to anybody, and I hope he watches this. So when it comes to the flying squirrels taking a potential promotion like that and running up the flagpole, who's above you? <laughs> Uh, well, Lou DiBella, our man, our owner, is is above me. Uh, but we're all a team, yeah. uh, and and actually, when it comes to something like that, I told JJ this. I got to walk down the hallway and talk to the food and beverage person because, like, you run a business, I run a business, and I think we're so much alike as individuals. I want everybody to have ownership. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I I, look, I follow you very closely on social media and the way that you treat. Your employees down there. In Hard Emporia. not to follow him on social media. He's uh, king I mean, of the selfie. I mean, well, no, I'm I'm trying to be like Hermie. I want to be like Hermie when it comes to selfies. But well, he, if you'd name your team the Flying Hermes, the Herminators. He would, yeah, he would be the Herminators that every day. You like the Herminators? 
For a small fee, we can let you do that. <laughs> well, and I know somebody that can negotiate the naming rights of that, that, apparently. Yeah, so. I can do that. Uh, but, but yeah, so I think it's really been cool how those friendships. I love making friends mm-hmm. through other friends. Yeah, sure. And, and that's how it's happened with uh, – even with with your brother and, and JD, like JD's the kind of guy that you can play nine holes of golf with him. We played eighteen. You play nine holes of golf with him, you're in his phone, and you're his friend forever. Mm-hmm. And that's the kind of person he is. And maybe you miss that on TV, or maybe you miss that on how crazy the thirty thirties portray him mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff. But that how was about, a, how about him and his boy winning the tournament early this year? It was one of the, the coolest father, things. That, it was yeah. one of the coolest things ever because I know what those kids mean to him. You know, he's been he's been. Were, were you able to help him with his golf swing while he was in town? So a reporter, we came off the the round, and a reporter came up to us and interviewed us, and I said, uh, "John, did you give Parney any tips?" He goes, "Yeah, I told him to take up tennis." <laughs> <laughs> he said Good that. Good advice. Yeah, he said that. I don't think you can wear those pants on a tennis court, but go ahead. I can. I, I wear these pants to church. Let me, let me tell you something. I'm just guessing right now. I that, want everybody to understand. I just said I go to church, so I want people to listen to that. <laughs> we'll we'll give you a little clip you can take with you, so you can play it over. Can and I over. send it to my mom? Sure. Yeah. Sure. But I'm telling you right now, if I. I bet in his closet, when you open that door, it looks like a unicorn uh, threw up in there. I mean, they, those are colors. I've got about 125 pairs. And this is actually JD's company, Loudmouth. Yeah. And and uh, I remember when I first started, everybody was joking, oh, you're wearing John Daly's pants. You're wearing well, John Daly's he, pants. But, uh, what? And and now and now when I'm with I, with him, I say tell people that John Daly wears mine. No, that's all right. That's right. Well, if you look at it, he's got clocks. I need to what stand up. up. But the socks. Calculators, yeah, stand up. The socks have squirrels on them. Can you see the pants? Got, I don't need a, you to model. Don't turn you. Don't don't do a complete twirl. It just, seems to be a, a school you, theme. You just saw my buttocks. <laughs> <laughs> you got the you shot me buttocks. into buttocks. Uh, I swear I'm never going to look at a clock the same way again. <laughs> I said I don't even know. I need to know what time it is. But look, it's about again all the the pants, the parney stick. It's all about having fun. It's all about making. It's memories. your gimmick, and that's that's what like you know. Wrestlers have them, right? Sure. You know, and and so that's something that's really stuck here in Richmond more so than any other place. And because of that, I'll, this is my last job. I'll be uh, I'll be working in Richmond until uh, until it's over with. Hopefully, hopefully on my own terms. <laughs> Let's hope, because it's great having baseball in Richmond. It really is, especially after we lost the R Braves. I think the Squirrels came from Connecticut. So the team, I had nothing to do with them because uh, Connecticut is my 49th state that I like out of 50. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> What's 50? 50? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I'm stuck on Connecticut being so bad. Um, but uh, I hope nobody from Connecticut's watching this. I apologize. Oh, that's where WWE is, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm screwed. I'm sure Vince is tuned in. Yeah, I'm sure he is. Yeah. He loves you. Yeah. Um, what was the question? <laughs> uh, what happened? I mean, they used to, they were in Connecticut. How did you oh. get them here? Cause it, they're, you're a double A. So Richmond left, Francisco, right? the Braves left. And then there was a bunch of teams because Richmond was a very desired market. Right. And there was a bunch of teams that wanted to come here, uh, from other parts of the country. And they'd had a, our owner, Lou DeBella had a rough time in Norwich, Connecticut drawn. I mean, they couldn't draw flies to a cow pie, if you know what I mean. And, but they didn't have you. Uh, well, they had some good people up there, but it just was a, a bad market uh, for for that. They had a bunch of casinos around there, and people went there for that. But the ballpark was built like literally three miles back in an industrial park. The first time I ever went there, I was in a cab back when they had cabs, and I literally thought the guy was going to cap me. Like, like It was like a three-mile drive back into this industrial area. Uh, so the ballpark, location, 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 right? And it was just a terrible location. But we ended up winning the bid for minor league baseball, major league baseball to move here. And then uh, I, I got into town August 2nd, 2009. Uh, and it was basic instantaneous love. I'd never been to Richmond before. The only time I'd been to Richmond before I moved here in 2009 was my senior year in college. We went to Myrtle Beach for senior week. Uh, and let's just say that I, it was necessary that I stopped in Richmond on the way back because uh, – I had to go to the bathroom. And I went to the bathroom where, Hermie? In the parking lot of the diamond that was just built. <laughs> wow. Fate. How about that? That was crazy. You yeah. leave Fate. your DNA, and then your DNA is now part of this baseball club <laughs> in that baseball stadium. Right. Yeah. Okay, yeah, this is a great sport. Full we, circle, baby. Full circle. <laughs> Were you wearing pants like that, by the way? No, the, I just start, I started doing this when I got to Richmond. Okay, because the cops would have seen you from a mile away if that was happening. <laughs> that was my senior year in college. I'm not sure I was wearing pants at that point, Senator. <laughs> 
<laughs> now I just threw up a Boy, little bit. This is, yeah. yeah. is going to have to be a two-hour show next yeah, time. Yeah, well, you know. Look, so I'm, here, I'm here for you. Senator Stanley and I certainly plan to come um, this spring and summer to support the Flying Squirrels. Tell our listeners and viewers where can they go to learn more about the Flying Squirrels, tickets, game schedules, those kind of things? Well, we, we have. We're, we're year-round as far as activities. Uh, we, we have all kinds of activities planned, whether it's games or otherwise. You know, one of the things we, we did, Hermie, during COVID is we did movies in the outfield. We turned the field into a Frisbee, uh, a, a Frisbee golf course. There's all kinds of things that we uh, do other than baseball. Squirrelsbaseball.com is our website that has all the information. You can follow us on all the socials. We have a wonderful full-time social media department, and we're very, very active on that. So follow us. April 12th is the home opener. That's the baseball-wise biggest date that's coming up. Well, I was looking on my computer. I checked uh-huh. your schedule. That's a packed schedule you've got. 69 home games, 69 away games. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. And that's good. That's a lot. That's a lot, a lot of opportunity. Well, you know, the thing the thing that we try really hard to do, and, and I'm not uh, – our staff does an amazing job. Every single one of those games is memory-making for somebody. Like, we, we work 69 home games, but Hermes family might only come to a Tuesday night game in April. So we got to do everything in our power to make sure that Tuesday night game in April – is a memory maker for the Saddlers. I want to encourage everybody who's listening, whether you be from Richmond area, anywhere in Virginia, neighboring states, please come out and support the Flying Squirrels. Great environment, great family environment, group specials, you name it, you guys. Can can I say one more thing? No, sir. Minor league baseball all across the country, Herman. There's 140 affiliated minor league, excuse me, 120 affiliated minor league baseball (laughs) teams. I forgot about 2020. 120 minor league affiliated baseball teams all across the country. So if you live in North Carolina, you live in Texas, wherever you live and you're watching this podcast, go check them out. You know, and that's exactly what we talk about here because we also talk about the short tracks, the rural areas that uh, support those short tracks, how important it is for their economies. Those baseball teams are important for those local economies. That's why when we lost them in Martinsville and Danville, we almost lost Pulaski, which is the Yankees over there. And Thank goodness we didn't lose the Salem Red Sox. But that has a devastating effect on those communities when those teams uh, pack up and leave. And it, and quite frankly, the ones that stayed and the ones that have been able to stay are the lifeblood in a lot of ways for the entertainment, for sports, to give young people that, that willingness to want to wanna play baseball. Um, it really does so much for the sport at the local level, just like stock car racing on the short tracks. Right. That community, community community. Amen. That's what it's all about. And whether you're a hot dog vendor or you're a full-time employee, there's literally hundreds of people that are employed by the squirrels uh, year round, uh, year round. And I think that makes a difference. And, you know, you're right about the short tracks and our, our South side, our, our clubby Joe T, you know, Joe T yeah, he, yeah. he, during the season, he would every Friday night, he'd pack his cooler and he was off to, off the South side, like clockwork. So those are memory making opportunities that are so important for Virginians and people all across the country. I agree. And, and you know, in a digital world, sometimes we got to get back to the roots of what really made us as, as that community. Right. And that fabric is always sports. That's the one thing we connector. come together. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we come together on. We may be on opposite sides in who we root for, right. but we still have the love of the game. And it's obvious, Parney, that you've got the love of the game. That, that, I mean, this is really kind of exciting. I, I didn't know you from Adam's house cat. And, and, and Wait, Hermie, Adam, Adam has a house cat? <laughs> <laughs> he does. And Hermie promised me you'd be entertaining and, and you'd be fun oh, to meet. And, uh, and look, you got a friend here over here as well. But just don't ask for any money from the government because I can't help you there because <laughs> they never give me any money but That's all right. for, for any projects. But, but you know, we all as, as politicians, elected officials, need to understand how important you are Thank you. to the fabric of the Commonwealth of Virginia. And it's really, really important to have you on. I, I appreciate you saying that because when somebody came, well, when we came to Richmond, somebody said, what What do you want the team to be? And I said, I don't want us to be a baseball team. I want us to be an important fabric in our community 365 days a year. And that's what we always strive for. And certainly having friends like the Herminator over here to my left is uh, has been a big part of it too. Well, let me And let me ask you one question. It's burning question because you know we've seen what the Washington football team this, this is going to be good. is now the Commanders, and uh, we'll have a guest who has a very strong opinion about that on this podcast that that Hermie did an interview with. How did you come up with flying squirrels? Because I think it's brilliant. It's a brilliant marketing idea. You guys do so well with it. The dude in the big head, you know, flying squirrel outfit looks pretty cool to all the kids. How'd you get there? 
Well, I have a personal services agreement with Tito's Vodka, and uh, that's how it all started, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> hey, can you get us one of those? Yeah. Well, Dale yeah, Jr.'s you, got a new vodka now, too. Does, yeah. And Elliot's been begging for it he, on social he's, media. He's been sending. He's going to send the case. We, we, we had a 15,000 entries in a Name the Team contest. But here's the, to answer your question, we wanted to be three things with the name. We wanted to be fun. We wanted to be different. And we wanted to be impactful. And all three of those things, no no team had ever named a team the Flying Squirrels. And we knew it was going to connect and be impactful with young children. And that's exactly what's happened. I mean, you really created a cartoon superhero. Right. Nazi. Out of a flying squirrel. You, you should walk into, Nazi? An, you walk into an elementary school with Nutsy, and it's like walking into London, England with Mick Jagger in the 1970s. Wow. I mean, it's rock star stuff. It's been great. It's been great. It's always great to be with you, Herm. Look, we got to look, Hermie. What we got to do is when the baseball season starts. Let's, let's do this podcast right there on the yes. At the stadium. Do it for Parney's Pub. Parney. Mm -hmm. Let's great. do that. It's my office, Parney's Pub. Who do we, can we talk to you directly? Or you got to talk to you your have people. To talk to Nutsy. Talk to Nutsy. Yeah, I'll get slapped Nutsy to talk to Nutsy. <laughs> there you go. And let, let them work it out. Yeah, and then uh, make sure you bring a guitar so we can hit Elliot over the head with it. He's oh, perfect for that. That would be an entertaining thing right there in the diamond. Yeah. Right there at second base. Yeah. We Even just, if nobody's we just slap nuts, takes on Elliot's the whole event. Time. We just planned the whole event. Boom. I got to go talk to the promotions department. We just changed our whole schedule. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Barney, uh, I appreciate you. Thank you, man. I got much love for you, Herbie. You've been a great and, friend. And, your, and your, whole, your whole family. Thanks for having me on. And Absolutely. Senator, great to, great to be with you, too. Great to be with you, my friend. And, and you taught me a lot today. And uh, you know what, Hermie? You were not wrong. What an entertaining figure he is. Never wrong. He's as entertaining I. as his pants. And I've never said that about a man ever in my life. And actually, we're going to have to scrub that and edit that out. Yeah. <laughs> or I'm not getting reelected ever again because they're just going to put that on a commercial. Bill Stanley loves men with funny pants. Funny. That's a great commercial. That's a good voice. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Pawnee, thank you again. Thank you. I uh, want to take this moment to remind our listeners that Pesomatic is an entertainment company which develops gaming software that players love to play and can use their skills to win every single time. Plus, these games of skill provide vital revenue to keep family-owned businesses like bars, restaurants, and convenience stores thriving. This has been another edition of Leaning Right and Turning Left with Sadler and the Senator. I'm State Senator, Virginia State Senator Bill Stanley, and I'm Leaning Right. I'm Hermie Sadler, and I'm Turning Left. It's been a great show. Parney, thank you. We're coming up right after this with Lynn O'Neill trying to save Southside Speedway. We'll be right back. NMLS number 65084, Equal Housing Lender. New Year's resolutions are just hard to keep up with, but saving money is easy at SaveWithConrad.com. Wouldn't 2022 be easier with lower monthly payments? Get the best rate you've ever had, pay off your credit card debt, and even get the cash you need right now at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit or money out of your pocket to get started, and you can even skip your next two house payments at SaveWithConrad.com. Find out how much money you can save for free at SaveWithConrad.com. Hi, folks. This is Hermie Sadler. Thanks for listening to our all-new podcast, Leaning Right and Turning Left with Sadler and the Senator. I hope you are enjoying the show as much as Senator Stanley and I enjoy bringing it to you. Whether you're a family traveling together or a truck driver hauling freight up and down the highway, I hope you will take the time to visit one of our Sadler Travel Plaza locations in Virginia and North Carolina. Sadler Travel Plaza locations are licensed dealer locations for pilot travel centers. And we also carry Shell Motiva Petroleum products for our four-wheel friends. We pride ourselves on providing one-stop shopping for service, food, and entertainment. Our food options include Five Guys Burgers and Fries, Quiznos, Dairy Queen, Hermie Sadler's Faux Show Bar and Grill, Victory Lane Restaurant, Hunt Brothers Pizza, Dunkin' Donuts, and much, much more. Our locations include Sadler Travel Plaza in South Hill, located off I-85 at Exit 12, the Sadler Travel Plaza of Emporia, which is conveniently located on Exit 11B off I-95, and Sadler Travel Plaza on Highway 58 in Suffolk. We also have our North Carolina location, Sadler Travel Plaza in Dunn, North Carolina, that's Exit 75 off I-95. We appreciate all of our customers. And Bill and I appreciate you listening to Leaning Right and Turning Left with Sadler and the Senator, powered by Pace of Madden. 
right. Welcome back. This is Leaning Right and Turning Left with Sadler and the Senator. I'm Senator Bill Stanley, and I'm Leaning Right. I'm Hermie Sadler, and I'm Turning Left and really excited about this next guest, uh, Bill. Uh, you've known for a long time, and, of course, we had Elliot, my brother, on the show a couple of weeks ago and talked about our uh, days of racing and, and younger years and one of the places that we both had a chance to race some back in the day and where I met a lot of the friends that I still have in racing today is not too far away from the Stanley Law Office. I can't do the studio uh, introduction like you do. I'll let you do that. Well, yeah, it's not too far from the Stanley Law Group studio, high atop the Stanley Law Group building overlooking beautiful downtown Richmond, the capital of the Commonwealth of Virginia. There you go. Uh, not too far away from here is the famous if you're a virginia stock car racing fan you know about the history of the famed south side speedway it, from everything i've read and i have not been there that is the cathedral of virginia racing unbelievable the history and the drivers that got their start and actually made names for themselves right there at south side speedway so just a little bit of a uh, go back in time a little bit right before covid hit the owners of the speedway seized operations at that time like a lot of other businesses due to covid and not being able to have live events and people in the stands well as we've still trying to come out of the back side of that and get back on track as far as racing and economy and other things south side speedway has yet to be reopened in fact it's been sold and so we wanted to get that story on we you know this podcast as we said from the beginning bill we're going to talk politics we're going to talk law but the joint love that we both have is racing and small businesses in the commonwealth of virginia and short tracks and the historic ones throughout virginia and north carolina the ones that built racing i mean this is this is the start of nascar and quite frankly the grassroots of nascar and it's where we need to almost get back to rebuild that sport and bring back those millions of fans that we've lost so this next guest fits right in that wheelhouse leon o'neill is longtime racer Longtime friend, and he is kind of leading the charge to try and bring Southside Speedway back to life. So I reached out to Lynn a couple weeks ago and said, we'd love to have you on the show. Um, Bill and I you know, really um, want to give a lot to this effort. So, Lynn, first of all, welcome to the show. Uh, a lot of race fans listen to this podcast. A lot of politicians listen to this podcast. And hopefully between the two of those, we can try to maybe help the crusade along uh, for what you're doing. But welcome to the show and tell us tell us kind of what your crusade has been when it comes to Southside Speedway. Well, I appreciate y'all having us on. And, uh, you know, it's it's the racetrack's been there since 1949 and, and it's it's been a very viable business and it's been an asset to Chesterfield County and the surrounding areas. Um, you know, it, it's such a great economic impact and it's a shame that these local uh, you know, counties and cities and stuff like that doesn't look at the short tracks like they should. So wh what is the status of the racetrack now? It's actually shut down. Um, the only thing left there is the racetrack. The county the county bought it, and they turned around and letting, letting uh, somebody, somebody turn around and, and sell all the stuff off and all that stuff. Um, but you know, it's, but it's enough air to work with, and it's in such a good locality. Who who, own, who owns the track? Chesterfield County. Bought Chesterfield it. County. Well, Chesterfield Economic Development bought it. Mm -hmm. So, um, the history that I'm I'm really learning about Southside Speedway. And look, I love anything that's called Southside because I come from Southside, <laughs> Southwest Virginia. I represent Southside Virginia. Started in 1949, opened as the Royal Speedway. Royal Speedway. It was renamed Southside Speedway in '59. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And here's where the real history comes in. NASCAR Hall of Fame inductee Wendell Scott, the Jackie Robinson of NASCAR, broke the color barrier. Famous Virginian from the beautiful city of Danville uh, was the 1959 Southside Speedway Sportsman Champion and the 1959 NASCAR Virginia State Sportsman Champion right at that track. Is that right? Yep. He's the first black American <clears throat> to ever win a NASCAR championship, and that was at Southside Speedway. I mean, that's a piece of history right there uh, that, that really has had a profound effect on the sport ever since, has it not? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And not yeah, only that, though, you've got Hermie Sadler, you know, one of your great friends, uh, started out on the, that track. 
one of our very famous NASCAR drivers currently to this day who became a champion of that track at the same time, or much later, of course, but also was a champion at Southside Speedway. Denny Hamlin, actually, you know, he, he actually, Denny never won a late model race at Southside Speedway, believe it or not. He didn't? Nope. And and he came real close when that, remember the race he had, the yeah. Denny Hamlin short track challenge? That's right. I raced in that. Right. Yeah. And uh, and I didn't make it race. Yeah. <laughs> I made it because I had a, a, a old fat guy TV media provisional. Provisional. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you don't have to qualify? That's, that's the qualification. Well, Denny called me about running that race and he said, look, I, I'll be glad to do it, but It'd be very embarrassing to go with. I had Virginia's for Lovers on my car that night, yep. and uh, kind of a throwback to my 25 days. And I said, "Look, I, I never was any good at Southside, and I'm sure 25 years later, I'm not going to be any better. Um, so I'll come if I get a guaranteed starting spot." So they, uh, I lobbied him <laughs> in y'all's terms to get me a spot. And what was really bad? So you were was, the pace car, exactly. <laughs> what was really bad is it was like. I don't know what fifteen of y'all guys yeah. that were guaranteed a spot and left five spots for us locals. Yeah, <laughs> so we're all beating and banging and killing each other in the heat, Running race. heat races and stuff. All right. I'm sitting on top of the truck. <laughs> yeah, watching they're, these guys they're all yeah. over there having a good time. Yeah. That sounds like hey, a good me, time. Me, we Wendell Scott, great. That's a great nugget from Southside Speedway. Unbelievable. Go down some of the other names of drivers over the years that competed won races and championships at Southside Speedway. Um well I mean you had four four rookie of the years there. Um it was oh, let me find everything. Uh, Lenny Pond, Bill Dennis, Jimmy Hensley, and Denny Hamlin. All four of those were Southside regulars. Mm-hmm. Um you had Ray Hendrick who was one of the top fifty drivers of all time in NASCAR. He that was his home track. Um Tommy Ellis Two-time national champion for NASCAR and Xfinity Series, you know, I mean, you know they don't come no tougher than Tommy Sonny Ellis, Hutchins. Sonny Hutchins, and, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, Al Grennan. I mean, you had tons of it, of everybody that ran there. It's just a lot of history, um, and just I mean, very unique racetrack too. Yeah, uh, very difficult to get around. But very much a mechanical type track. Very easy to overdrive. Yep. Not not very big tight corners. It's one of those things that old DW used to say most times you can slow down to go faster, uh, those kind of things. So uh, we want to bring you in so you can tell us. You, you've been kind of on a on a mission to bring this speedway back. So wh- what are you doing? What are you trying to do? Who's trying to help you? And what kind of opposition are you facing? Well, we've we've got a group. Um, we've got a group of investors and, and it's four of us, and we've actually got everything ready to go. We're just trying are to. Are you get, trying to buy the track? Oh, we're trying to buy it. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we're trying to buy it. So, so after COVID, I guess it was sold to the county? The county, yeah, I mean, they, they ended up with it, let's put it that way. And, and, and now they're, we've had meetings with them and working back and forth with some board of supervisors, and um, they're either talking lease purchase to us or outright buying it. And, uh, you know, we've got everything ready to go. I mean, we've we've actually got, you know, a nice VIP areas and stuff like that. We want to we want to bring it to the 2000s. You know what I mean? It's sitting there basically like 1950 or 60. You know, yeah, still, but I love that kind of stuff. Oh, it's the, great. The way it was because yeah. you can close your eyes and you can see all those great racers oh, yeah. uh, making laps. Yeah, around and, the track. and it's a tight little track. It's a, it's a lot like Bowman Gray. Mm-hmm. How long is it's it? It's a one-third mile. It's just a tad oh. bigger than Bowman Gray. What's it? What's the seating capacity right now? These well, the it was pictures 50, I saw look like little bleachers. Yeah, yeah. it was 5,500. So, but I, right now all the, all the bleachers are gone. Everything's gone except for the actual racetrack. So you would have to do some major rehabilitation. Yeah, yeah. And to bring it up to to current. But it ne- it needed it anyway. And I, when you had races there, I mean, were you filling the stands? Well, that sounds pretty good. She, she did at at certain times. I mean, it's and back you know naturally like in the nineties, it was packed every week from start. You know, you couldn't fit another person into place. But uh, you know, it, it's. It could be done again. I mean, it's it's it could be the Bowman and Gray of, of Virginia. Huh. How much money are you planning to or looking at spending on this facility? This is a twelve to fourteen million dollar project. You know, that's total renovation, VIP building suites, and their whole nine yards. Well, mm-hmm. <laughs> Hermie, you got that in your pocket. Why don't you just yeah. take care of it on the hip? <laughs> right. But I. But so, why would anybody be against somebody investing twelve to fourteen million dollars? into a facility with that kind of history in South South Virginia? Well, I really think it's it's 
the county doesn't understand what that place has meant to the county because it's you know I, I don't know if it's because people have moved here from out of state and and they're in power and just feel what's going on with that you know what i mean but but it's you know it's it's a ritual every friday night i mean people you know we, we we have up to 285 potential events that we plan on doing there. Well, and not only just racing, you could probably do amphitheater, right. concerts, concerts, those kind of things to yeah. bring in a lot of other concerts, drawers. car shows, swap meets, double J with a guitar, show. wrestling. Yep. Yeah, we got all kinds of stuff we got going on. Yeah, you know, that it, once everything gets settled down, we get to get it in our possession, hopefully. And what I, you know, what I know about Chesterfield, there's no other real venue like that around there, is there? No, it's actually the longest running sports venue in Chesterfield County. So, wow. it, and it's and it's always, you know, it's always contained itself. It's never had government subsidized help or nothing like that. All privately owned up to this yep. point. Now. Um, what it, so if Chesterfield acquired, I would think it's through their EDA, Economic Development Authority. Um, what are their plans for it if it's not going to continue to be a racetrack? The the area is actually a, a area zone that's more industrial, and they're building a water park, probably about a half a mile down the road, on the other side of two eighty eight. So, and they got the the River City Sportsplex, which is a soccer park. And they're they're trying to revitalize that area for some reason, but it's got an industrial park on one side, it's got a dump on the other side, and it's got a rock quarry. Hmm. So, I mean, you know, I don't know how the par- how the soccer park ended up right in that area, but I mean, it's it's not. I don't have a problem with the soccer park. You know, we could have all of it. Well, soccer park, racetrack, right. water park. I mean, that sounds like a heck of a combo. Right. Uh, what kind of resistance are you getting right now to your proposals? Um, no, and actually, we, we just can't get a solid yes answer. Okay. You know, I mean, we've, we've so far, the county has never said no to us on any meeting we've been to. Um, and the EDA, I mean, you, you, we want them involved because, I mean, it's, we'll, we'll employ up to 200 people a year, you know, mostly part time. But, I mean, we, between all the events we have. So, I mean, we're, we're doing everything the county needs. We're, we're, we're paying good tax base on it. We're pay, you know, we're having a bunch of employees. And we're revitalizing a, a, an, an area along with what they're doing. Um, Bill, who is the uh, who's there? Who, who's the senator for that district? That would be Amanda Chase. And I don't know if Amanda's in that district. Hashmi or Amanda Chase, probably. Yeah, I, th- I don't think it's Amanda. Okay. Because, um, but Am- you know, Amanda actually sponsors a race car at Dominion Raceway. Yeah. Well, there you go. And so, you know, I, I, I mean, I'm just listening to this right now, Hermie. My problem is, is that when we lose a racetrack like this, a historic racetrack like this, we never get, never get it back. Never get it and, back. And you're talking about, you know, when you look at the names here, Wendell Scott wins a championship. That's like in this sport, George Washington slept here, which you see in Alexandria all the time and other places. And those places are preserved and they are sanctified and they're raised up and they're used. And, and we remember those things because they're so important to the psyche of, of America. I mean, Racing in Virginia is the second most watched or attended sporting event, is it not, in the yep. Commonwealth? Yep, second largest sport, spectator sport in the state of Virginia, only behind college football. And that's amazing to me because we have 14 or 15 short tracks that historically were the short tracks were the beginnings of NASCAR, right. where the moonshiners who became racers and became legends uh, took out their cars and raced each other and started now what is a multi-billion dollar sport that everything... Uh, everything, you know, people across the nation and, and in different countries watch. Now, we've watched fan bases, you know, they swelled, they swelled up probably 2001 was a peak. We've lost a lot of that fan base. We need to get it back. And, I, and as I said earlier, I think the way to do it is right here in these small short tracks. That's why I sponsored a piece of legislation that became law establishing the NASCAR Stock Car Heritage Trail through the Commonwealth of Virginia where we celebrate these short tracks, do everything we can to preserve them, Old races there because it also not only celebrates that history, Hermie, but it also helps those small businesses all the way around them. Yeah, you know, it's it's right down the ballpark, right right down the middle of what we're trying to uh, get behind and try to promote. You know, Lynn, you may or may not have heard it, but Bill and I started 
uh, this year a open wheel modified team. Yeah, I've heard. And what uh, I got to do getting a seat? Yeah. Well, you have to get a porta power first. Yeah. Because the same thing I needed to get. In. <laughs> I was gonna say your seat probably fit, man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no. I told I told on the po- prior podcast we had to design the uh, driver's side window a little wider to get uh, old Herman down door. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. But we uh, kind of like those walk-in things for the showers when you get older, that so you don't have to climb know, over the top. Last year, uh, last October, Bill talked me into. Uh, running the smart tour race at, at motor mile and you know my wife rode up there with me and my kids and uh just driving back into the speedway kind of gave you that old throwback feel of like a south side south boston type feel you know that i had you know in the early 1990s and so i agree with bill completely you know we've kind of lost a whole generation of fans and the best way to you know, get them back. We have to do it one at a time. Oh, yeah. And that is to have a facility and a location and a place uh, like Southside Speedway. And that, that track has so much, we have not, we've already said it, history, but, I mean, just built-in support, fan base. I mean, you know, back in the day when, when I was starting my late model days, you know, that, that was a, I mean, that was a, yeah, it was a place to be. You Jack, know? Jack Tant told me at Richmond one time, we, me and him and Ronnie Elder were mm-hmm. walking into the garage area actually at richmond and uh ronnie introduced me to him and i'd never met jack you know what i mean i i knew of him who yeah. didn't know of him you know yeah. what i mean he said this is leonard neal you know he races south side and it's done pretty good and he goes he said well if you can do good at south side you can do good anywhere anyway yeah that's right so and, yeah now did you ever lynn did you ever run against her i don't think we ran a whole lot hermy had moved up to bush Right when I came into the late models. I knew Lean was coming, so I got the hell out of there. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> you make smart decisions a lot yeah. of times. Now we yourself, raced, don't you? We never raced go karts together, but we were at the same racetracks and yeah. all. Because yeah. I was laughing coming up here. I was yeah, thinking about I went to Barnesville, Georgia with Jimmy McCoy. Did you, you was that were you Danny when Raymond Bowling? I went down there with Danny. Skin up? I went down there when Danny drove the first Honda motor. Honda for Enix Sanders. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And your dad was sitting there at the scale. With the checkbook. Yeah. <laughs> he said, I want that motor. Yeah. And the man said, kept saying no. And finally, he, Mr. Sadler took the motor home. Yeah. 80 <laughs> glorious years. Yeah. Uh, on the planet. Cool. What a great guy. We uh, carried, Hermes just telling that story, one of Raymond Bolin, uh, back in the go-karting days, Raymond, what a character. Yeah. He would show up to the go-kart track with his old Scorpion in the back of a station wagon. So he had like a, almost like the Chevy Chase Metallic P family truckster. <laughs> so Raymond's in the front seat. He had the cooler beer in the second seat and the go-kart in the back seat. And he ran mostly dirt. But he went with us to Barnesville one time, rode with us. And, um, and Raymond built engines too, actually a oh, really yeah. good engine builder. Oh, yeah. And and so he built motors and, and raced go-karts. So he, he wanted to go with us to Barnesville, Georgia. Uh, so he got into Suburban. We all rode into Barnesville, Georgia. This is an asphalt road course. And Raymond, as far as I know, had never been on anything like that, other than maybe Powhatan. That was a smaller version road course asphalt that we, we rode backwards. But anyway, so we're at Barnesville, Georgia. I'm 14, 15, Elliot's 7 or 8. We're down there. You know, this is big-time stuff, you know. And um, Raymond never even bought a pit pass. He just started walking around and talking to everybody. He knew Raymond knew everybody. Well, somehow or another, about halfway through practice, I heard this and all of a sudden practice was stopped. And I uh, turned around and Danny came over there and said, and Raymond then flipped a cart on the track. I said, Raymond who? He said, Raymond Bowling. He rode down there with us. I didn't even know he I know he didn't have a cart. And I did I so I don't know who's but he went out there with a helmet on with no jacket, no leather jacket, no nothing, and flipped on that asphalt and skint his butt from one end to the other. And um, So what, did you strap him to the top of the Suburban to get him home because he couldn't <laughs> sit in the seat? I, I, I don't know. It's, it's <laughs> Raymond, you have to know, telling you some stories about people you don't know, but you would like Raymond Bowling, I can oh, tell you a, that. Sounds yeah, like it already. A, yeah, he's a hoot. They, uh, matter of fact, you remember the go-kart that Danny drove? Mm-hmm. It was an X-cart that, yep. from Elite Kart? Yep. I've got Jimmy McCoy's. Oh, do you? Yep. I, I went somewhere to buy one for my... I, at the end of the year, when I first started racing race cars, I, I was still racing go-karts at, up at Capital City. Mm-hmm. And uh, all my guys on my crew started wanting to race, and I had a Townsend-built go-kart, which I'd won a ton of go-kart races with mm-hmm. up at, up there in Amelia. 
And, and so I said, I said, no, nah, y'all are not driving my car. I said, I went and bought them a cheap old Expert 3 or something like that. Well, the, get, when the guy I bought it from had it hanging on the, had, had the X card hanging on the wall. I said, where'd you get that at? And he's told me something. And I said, well, you want to sell it? He goes, yeah, I took it apart and can't get it back together. <laughs> I said, I said, what do you want for it? He said, we take, give me $25 for it. I said, heck yeah. And I brought it on home. I still got it. Wow. I want to take this moment to rem- remind our listeners that this show is powered by Pesomatic, an entertainment company that develops gaming software. Players love to play and can use their skills to win every time. Pesomatic partners with small businesses, the economic backbone of Virginia. So you mentioned uh, Jimmy McCoy. Hadn't heard that name in 20 years. And J.D. McCoy. Yeah, J.D.'s passed away. Yeah. Um, Jimmy lives in Northern Virginia. Does he? Yeah, and I, every once in a while we ho- we holler at each other and check on something. But you know, Jimmy was probably the most talented race race car driver, or, you know, that I ever saw. But he never set foot, never set his butt in, in a race car. Mm-hmm. You know, what I mean, it's all for go kart racing. I can remember him racing against uh, uh, Jeff Burton mm-hmm. and and just waxing Jeff Burton. Yeah, you know what I mean. And they we, they pitted with us um, at some of the old. Um, VKA and VDKA races, you know, yep. back in the mid '80s, and Danny was really close with JD, right? And raced some with Jimmy. Jimmy, a little bit older than me, I'm guessing. It was Jimmy. Is he mid '50s, something like that? Jimmy is probably close to 50. fifty. Is he? Yeah, he's a little bit younger than me. Yeah. Because it was funny because we grew up together and you know not far apart and went to the same high school and all that. And I'd grab him every morning and take him to school yeah. before he got his license. And we, you know, I had a '79 Trans Am, so we. We get to school pretty quick. <laughs> you know? but, Bill, um, I'm in the go kart business, so we'll talk about that on a whole nother podcast. Oh, I thought you were leading into it, right? No, no, <laughs> well, that's a whole nother show. I still got to sell you one for your son. But it's amazing to me to see how much, you know, everybody comes from there, and that is a really big industry, really big business. Oh, yeah. yeah. You don't hear or see much of it. Yeah. But it is everywhere, it sounds like. Yeah, I got well, some, of, some of the best times, I can honestly say, some of the best times, some of my best friends. That I still have today came from our days go karting. Oh yeah, I before we even started late model racing, because go kart racing, you know, you would go and be there all day, maybe all weekend, and y'all pitted out together, and it was, you know, you were out talking. When you started racing, it's kind of more secluded and kind of, you know, I'm not gonna say more serious because we always race seriously, but it was just the uh, the the way go kart racing worked. It was more, uh, it 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 produced more camaraderie i guess you might say that, yeah. that i really enjoy it well probably more family style more family style yeah, yeah i can remember i can remember y'all having to chase down elliot all the time get him in a go-kart because he was over there playing with somebody yeah yeah <laughs> a little bitty scrawny dude too when he was yeah. little <laughs> time to tell you about something i'm super passionate about protecting your family yes this is a life insurance ad for goliathlife.com but to me this is really about peace of mind think about insurance for a second We all get medical and auto insurance, yet we never even know if we're going to have a need for it. Let me let you in on a little secret. You need life insurance. We're all going to die. Now, as you let that reality sink in, think about what would happen if your family stopped having your income tomorrow. If you don't have a plan for that, you need to visit goliathlife.com. And I mean right now. And just personally, I've lost two friends in their 40s this past year and a half, and I don't even want to think about what their families would be going through had they not had life insurance. If you don't have it, get it. Protect your family. And I suggest you go to GoliathLife.com because they've made the process of getting affordable life insurance super easy. Goliath Life streamlines the life insurance process by allowing you to get quotes for more than 20 carriers within minutes and you'll pick your terms and payments to fit your budget. You pick your price, you start the online application immediately, and even schedule the medical exam to come to you. And I've done it. They sent someone to my office. I skipped the phone calls, the paperwork, and the crazy invasive conversations. Goliath Life makes buying life insurance simple. There's no hidden fees, no upsells, no hassle. Hell, not even a phone call. Goliath Life is life insurance in your hands on your time. Get multiple quick quotes right now from the comfort of your own home and begin your application in a few easy clicks right now at goliathlife.com. I didn't, uh, I didn't tell these stories when Elliot was on the podcast cause he gets sensitive about it, but I'll tell you Elliot's first, first two nights of racing first in go-karts, then in late model stock cars, first night in go-karts, 
Uh, Danny Wyatt, we went down to competition cart and bought a Margay Expert 2. We started going to race up at Broadnax on Friday nights at Tanner Town, they called it. I hadn't been to the racetrack but twice, ran twice, till baby brother Spool Riding Elliot had to have a go-kart. <laughs> so, of course, you know, baby brother Spool Riding Elliot gets gets what he wants. So A better go-kart. I, bet, no, no, I can't say that, but a good go-kart. We went back to competition karting, bought Elliot a kart motor. So in those days, I was running what I think were, I remember on Friday nights at Broadnax to be called Trans A Stock, which was maybe 12 to 14 year old, something in like that. So Elliot went and he would be running the maybe the seven, eight, nine year old class. So the first night he goes to, to Broadnax to race, there's about 15 in my class, but none in Elliot's class. Not a single cart in his age group. They were all in my age group. So. We talked to Mike Lundy at the track and officials and all that. We decided, well, we're going to just let Elliot race in our class, but we're going to let him start last and get in the back of the pack and just be on the track with some other carts so he could learn. So we go through practice, do all that. We're going to start the feature. And so we tell Elliot, everybody does, including the race directors, that Elliot, just get, you know, 20, 30 feet behind the rest of the carts. And when the green flag drops, just, just get you some experience and ride. There's nobody else in your class. You're going to get the trophy. So guess what happens? They dropped the green flag in our race, the Trans A stock class, and we were running to the right back in those days. You, we would actually go uh, clockwise huh. around the track. Oval? Yeah. Okay. Elliot goes in turn one and cuts across the infield <laughs> and tries to pass the whole field, comes back <laughs> up on the track, slides – and hits uh, William Brown, Lindsey Brown's son, and hits and flips over and bent his go-kart up and knocked the header off the engine and all that first corner of the first race. And uh, so I, I pull back around. I drive all the way back around, and we stop because we had the red flag and the ambulance and all that. I go over there, and Elliot's crying. My first, oh, my God, he's hurt already. Because he was crying because his go-kart was broke. But he went, he did not follow instructions and he came right back off the infield and crashed everybody. So another quick story. First time he's him and my dad plotted for his first laps on a late model stock car. I had gone to orange County speedway on a Wednesday to practice my late model. We had a 200 lapper coming up on Saturday. So there's 12, 15 cars there practicing on a Wednesday. So I go, Morris Johnson's my crew chief. And we go and practice and practice and practice and practice and practice. My mom and dad are off on, uh, out of town on a Shell Motiva trip for, for Shell Petroleum. They're out of, out of town. Elliot, you know, is there with us. We get through testing, get me to load the car in the trailer. We had old bag phones back day, back that day, the bag phone clipped on the back of my car. Elliot comes over there before we start loading the car up. Come here. Daddy wants to talk to you. <laughs> like, we did. So I go get to, get on the phone with my dad, and uh, yes, sir. He said, "Let Elliot dry that car before y'all come home." I said, "What?" <laughs> he said, "Let Elliot dry." I said, "Daddy, we've been here practicing all day. We got a two hundred lap race on Saturday." I said, "Let him dry that car." So, unbeknownst to me, Elliot had packed a helmet and a suit and everything in a bag and threw it in the trunk of my car. So he pulls out all this stuff that he's, they had this master plan that he was going to drive my late model after get him some laps in. So, okay. So he puts his stuff on and it's a whole uh, a bunch of other people there practicing. So we get him in, get him situated, never driven a stock car in his life. So I tell him, I said, listen, got your radio on. Can you hear me? Check one, two. Yep. 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 I said, look, go on the racetrack. But as soon as anybody else pulls on the track, come back in and wait for them to get done, and you can go back out. Okay, okay, okay. So he goes out. I'm talking to him. You doing all right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Kirk Leon has a late model, black number 22. He pulls out on the track. All right, Dave, bring it on in. All right, Dave, bring it on in. Somebody else on the track. And he's getting faster and faster. And faster. Then all of a sudden he starts hanging the ass in that coming off turn four, you know, like, oh my God. <laughs> Elliot, bring it in. 
So about five laps later, he all of a sudden, the radios ain't working. He comes off turn four, gets loose, overcorrects, hits the wall, comes back off the wall, and Kirk Leon T-bones him in the door. Ooh. So I couldn't get back to the bag phone fast enough <laughs> to call my daddy. Guess what? How'd he do? Not only have you got to replace my car, you got to replace Kirk Leon's car too. <laughs> got to buy two. <laughs> so I only say that in saying that he came a long way. What, what, <laughs> when he got out, did, was he crying because the car was broke? He was not speaking. Because hmm. I don't remember exactly how he did it, but I'm quite sure that that ended up being my fault somehow. Is that right? Yeah. That's the way it works. But he did kind of like you do me sometimes. You start big timing me while you get busy with your political stuff, and then you don't talk to me for three days, and then bad things happen. Right, right. You do things without talking to me, yeah. and then all of a sudden I got to explain it. Yeah. Right? yeah. But that's, that's how the friendship sometimes works. So I, I can guarantee you, I call him every night. <laughs> we don't miss a if beat. If you don't want me to say something stupid, you better call me. Call I don't me miss anymore. a beat with you. He's like, hey, take the whole weekend off. I'll, I'll talk to you on Sunday. Nope. nope. But I, I take, you, you know, as I get home. My summer, you know, I think back now, man, the late model days. Uh, Emmanuel and Butch Savakis and Neil Cully, Curtis Markham, Bobby King. Yeah. I mean, right on down. And the guys I raced against, Roy Hendrick, Bugs Harefield, Barry Begley, Maurice Hill, David Blankenship. I mean, a who's who. These guys, given the right opportunities, some of them did, but all of them were just as good as anything I saw at any level of racing uh, in my entire life. And they all, for the most part, either raced or mechanic or worked on cars right over here at Southside Speedway. So much history, um, and I have so many friends. What's your fondest memory, man? Uh, I mean, I, I, I guess the three championships I won at Southside were pretty good. You know what I mean? <laughs> Usually that's a good yeah, memory. Yeah, pretty good. And, I, and Lenny was helping me. Uh, you know, Lenny Pond was a NASCAR Cup driver, and I grew up around him. Um, we grew up in the same town in Ettrick, Virginia, so – when I was little, I used to sneak out the house and I'd go three blocks over and I'd be hanging out with Lenny. And, you know, my parents would call and go, like, Where's Lenny at? I'm like five years old and I'm over there. <laughs> you know, it's, wow. you know, they wake up or something and I'm already gone. <laughs> Lenny Pond, what a what a Virginia gentleman, too. Yeah, Great they guy. don't make they don't make them no better. Yeah. Than that. Did you ever have to go, you know, get out of the way of Elliot? Because it sounds like he, a lot of people probably did. <laughs> I, I, I remember one time at South Boston, I went down there and I never really raced at South Boston very much. And something happened at Southside or something, and we left and went down there. And, and they had that bad bump going in turn three. And I walked over to Elliot. I said, Elliot, how the, what do I got to do to get this thing through that bump? He said, you know, which I didn't know. You know, we didn't have shocks like y'all guys yeah. had down there. You know, like, like Elliot and them had down there. We, they were a little bit ahead of us on the shock deal. And uh, so he said, well, if you got new tires, you can go across it. He said, but if you got old tires after five laps, he said, you better let off for that bump. And he was right. <laughs> you know, it was a big difference how, how that bump was. And he but, knew uh, that track. And I had a spirited yeah. battle that night with, with uh, James Johnson. I know James Johnson. Jimmy Johnson. And yeah. he drove for Bill Meyer, Jack yeah. Bill Meyer. Mm -hmm. And me and Jimmy him had Johnson? a spirited battle for last not, place. Not the same, Jim. Okay. Not the same. Oh, that's the real Jimmy Johnson. You mean... The one that race the one seven 48. championship. Oh, I don't know. I don't remember that. He wrote he wrote for Jack Bielmeyer. Drove for Jack I Bielmeyer. I never knew that. Drove my, when my dad was a promoter at Southampton Speedway, mm -hmm. he actually ran down there. Yeah. I got to tell you a funny Southside story. Please. Um, Southside, as I uh, already stated, I, I never raced there a whole lot. Maybe five times in my late model career ever. But we decided we were going one Friday night, and that was a tough i mean the, the the guys that race there every week were just you won't want hardly show up there on a friday night and and win over there but i went over there and uh and raced and ran terrible i mean i probably got lapped about you know two or three times my dad a little bit of a competitive nature that he is he comes over and like he's gonna start pulling the decals off my car you know like making a point that I'm not sponsoring a car that's going to run that bad. Hmm. He was going to pull the decals off. But so he, I mean, he just, and he come told me, he said, look, you, you just, you need to, you need to go ahead and give it up. This is embarrassing. And I'm like, well, you know, <laughs> so my mom and dad leave. So me and Morris and doc and all my guys, we load up, we headed back to Emporia. I'm in the dumps. I've run terrible. And my dad has told me to quit. So 
we go back, get back to the shop around one, two o'clock in the morning. We get to unload the car and Mar said, what are we going to do? Cause my dad has told everybody we're done. I said, what are we going to do? I said, well, before we quit, we're going to go race one more time. He said, we are, where are we going? I said, we're going to Manassas. So we rescaled the car, stayed there all night. Dot justice cooked a, like a chicken muddle. And we worked on the car, left the next morning and went to old dominion speedway in Manassas. I never even told my parents I was going. I said, but we all threw our money in together to buy tires because my dad, my sponsor, had pulled the plug, you might say. Hmm. So we drove to um, Manassas that next night. So about time I got there and got signed in and started practice, I called my mom because I felt like I needed at least – I won't want to talk to my dad. I told my mom. I, she said, where are you at? I said, I'm in Old Dominion Speedway of Manassas. She said, your daddy's going to kill you. I said, I know it, but I'm going to race one more time than I'm, you know. So we go practice Dickie Boswell. Um, um, trying to think out 55 Charlie High, Charlie, Charlie Ford, Charlie Ford. Yeah, uh, that he group, was tough, tough. Yeah. Anyway, so we go, it's a 100 lap race. I win the race, first ever late model stock car win the night after my dad told me to quit. Really, and was I, that the motivation? I don't I mean, know, I don't know, but I won the race. I come back down to victory lane, first ever late model stock car win. Pull up and get out, do the flag, and start talking. And guess who walks across the track? My mom and dad. They had gotten in the car from Emporia and drove to Manassas and sat in the stands and watched that race. Wow. I, I went to Manassas one time, took Lenny with wow. me. And Lenny hadn't been there since. You don't like me popping the pin off and on? <laughs> no. No, no. Our, our executive <clears throat> producer, Chad Monday, has uh, told me to take the pen away it's, from it's, it's nervous fidgety energy. <laughs> Clearly. I guess we, I mean, do you want like a Rubik's Cube or something? Yeah, I need something. Plane? I need something. <laughs> One of those popper things? I guess, is this better? <laughs> <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Mm. Yeah, we we went to Manassas one time, and I had Lenny with me, and he said all the way up there. He says, you know, we get there, we will get up on top of the trailer. I'll show you where to run at, because Lenny was really good up there. Yeah, and uh, so <laughs> we get to the racetrack, and we start walking across it. And Lenny puts his arms out, and he goes, he saw he he looked this way and he looked that way. He said, he said, Lynn, he said, I ain't been, I haven't been here since nineteen seventy six, I think it was, and this is ninety six or ninety eight. I was there. He goes. The only two different, the only two things different is that scoreboard and then Porter Johns. <laughs> <laughs> so we get to get into the racetrack, right? We unload the car, we set the things up on top of the trailer, and get up there. And me and Lenny up there, and he, I, I said, Lenny, I got this. He goes, What do you mean? I said, I'll just run where there's no grass at. <laughs> <laughs> the track had so many cracks, yeah. and then all the grass was growing through it, but except where the groove was, yeah. so you could tell really Stay where it was. Stay off the grass. Yeah. And I finished third that night. Stay yeah. off the grass. Yeah, I yeah. ran really I good. I went to many a race up there with my father, and then yeah. they had the drag strip there, too. That's right. Yep. And yeah. it, uh, and up then back then, you know, Northern Virginia wasn't that big and bustling and busy. And uh, But I tell you what, if you wanted every – Northern Virginia redneck. If you think there was a Northern Virginia redneck, they were all packed in those stands oh, yeah. in the '80s and '90s, and and it was one of the most. I mean, that's again one of the glorious places of racing. Well, you know, we have to save these tracks. We have to bring history because if you're going to take a track out that the first African American stock car racer won a championship at, yep. then you better have a good reason well, because I think you can make more from just the history and what you guys are planning on doing with it than turning it into what condominiums or what are they going to do i i guess i guess soccer park or something like that yeah we need to save yeah, south yeah, side speed yeah hey, hey, look, uh, so uh one more time i want to remind everybody that leaning right and turning left is powered by pacematic who is a local and small business focused company you'll find pacematic games in bars restaurants clubs and truck stops as well as convenience stores across virginia we appreciate bill pacematic and their support not only of the podcast but also of ss racing and our quest to bring back grassroots racing uh, across the mid-Atlantic and including some of these tracks in Virginia through the Smart Modified Tour. So, Lynn, we've got a, just a couple more minutes left. What can people do to help you get to where? And, and, Bill, the questions you were just asking, talking about Wendell Scott and all that, the biggest problem is people just don't know. Right. They don't know. So, Lynn, tell us before we uh, sign off here, what, what can people do to, to help you bring south side speedway back to life well i mean naturally we need to let our let our elected officials know that 
you know, we need a racetrack. You know, we, we need it needs to stay. It's a, we got one right here. It's an integral part of of Chesterfield County and has been for you know for seventy years. So that's a big part. Mm-hmm. Um, not only that, I mean, there's plenty of stick and ball sports things in Chesterfield County, and, and racing is a unique sport because you know you could take a kid that's not or an adult that's not a stick and ball sport type person, and they can play that game. You know, what I mean, you can play a race car. You know, you do do that. Um, and like somebody got on one of the Facebook pages the other day and started saying it, you know, it's not going to be, it's no chance and this, that, and the other. And, you know, I said, and they said something about racing and I said, you know, racing is very, and it's a very intelligent sport. I said, cause you know, you have to know geometry and math and, and marketing and, and all kinds of different things. It's not just going out on a field and kicking a ball, you know what I mean? So, you know, they need to give us a place to play to and 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 we have the means of doing it you know it, it's a economic impacts 33.5 million dollars anything else around there is only 16 million dollars a year so we is there any kind of website or any kind of place that people can go to learn more information about what you're trying to do or if you will don't have one set one up and tell me where it is cuz what we'd like to do in the upcoming podcast as we continue to had this short track initiative, people need to have a place they can go find information and get resource resourceful information on on what's going right. on and, and and those kind of things. Well, we've been working off of the Remembering Southside Speedway page on Facebook. Um, just, Remembering Southside Speedway. Yeah. Okay, and it's because it's they already had two thousand and some people on it and stuff uh-huh. like that. So we and the, and the the guy running that is really us as old Southside guy, you know. So he's all into it. Mm-hmm. Um, and we've got you know, we've got a lot of people helping us with stuff, um, but that's pretty much the main page that we're working off of, mm-hmm. um, just because of so many people already there. And Lynn, it sounds like you're just waiting for the green light, you're, yeah, with we, the green flag to drop uh, yeah. from the Chesterfield Board of Supervisors. Is that right? I had a meeting with my investor yesterday, and he said we're ready to go. So all we need so. is the local politicians to say we're going to save this very historic track. Because it means more to the fabric of our society, our community, and our history than a soccer park, which we have down the street. Right. Is that right? And, and, and I don't mind the soccer park. We can all work together. You know what I mean? It, uh, you know, we, we want to do a big simulator room and have, have like 20 or 30 simulators in there and have a simulator league. Uh, we want to do, you know, go-kart racing, at, you know, naturally over at the racetrack, some road course stuff in the infield type deal, like Dominion does. Mm-hmm. Um so I mean, it's 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 a lot of stuff that we can do there. We the the we have a concert. The design of the building has a concert hall, six hundred people. You can do a concert right in the infield, can not you? We could do concerts I mean, in the infield, which we already plan the amphitheater. See, so ladies and gentlemen, if you're listening to this awesome podcast of leaning right and turning left with Sadler and the senator, and you're a Virginia legislator, or you're a member of the Chesterfield Board of Supervisors, or you live in Chesterfield or any counties around Chesterfield, and you love racing. Call your local politician. Let them know we need to save Southside Speedway. We need to save it. It's a part of our history. And not only just save it in its current form, we have investors right here on this podcast that are ready to put it into its proper form to make a great venue for not just races but also other family and community events. This is an opportunity that Chesterfield should not and cannot, I believe, turn down or turn away. So we need to get that momentum going You've got 100% behind myself. You know, we ought to talk to Matthew out of uh, Lost Speedways with Dale Jr.'s uh, mm-hmm. unbelievable um, great documentary show. on Peacock. Yeah. We ought to get them interested as well because alone, just with this on Wendell Scott's uh, history, I'm really good uh, friends with Warwick Scott, Frank Sr., Frank Jr. Frank Jr. is a teacher right up here in Richmond. I didn't know um, that. You know, that is an important part of the history because they've had to fight for Wendell Scott's history and place in history. I mean, they just only recently got the Jacksonville trophy that was denied them. And yet this is recognized history territory where he won a championship. First African-American race car driver to do so. We can't let Southside Speedway go. Lynn, I really appreciate you coming. Appreciate you being here. We'll have you back um, in, in another episode you know, down the road to give us an update. And I know I'll do my part to try to uh, reach back out to, to people and try to get more people online. You've got a, a staunch advocate in Senator Stanley. Um, that loves racing and loves Virginia, loves small business, and loves everything that Southside Speedway will be good for. 
So he'll be advocating for you there as well. We appreciate everybody who downloads and listens to Leaning Writing, Turning Left with Sadler and the Senator Bill. It's always a pleasure. And we'll, uh, these stories like this is what, uh, what our podcast is all about. It is exactly what we're talking about. It's exactly what we fight for. And this is why we're here. And so I'm just so proud to, to, to meet you, Lynn, for the first time. Thank you for telling us this history. Thank you for your passion for racing and your desire to save Southside Speedway. I'm leaning right. I'm State Senator Bill Stanley. I'm Hermie Saddle, and I'm turning left. We'll see you next time.